Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Most of us remember that conflict that arose a couple of years ago that became big news, that controversy of fake news. Political parties and newsrooms were accused of applying their own spin to news stories to destroy the reputation and credibility of individuals running for or holding public office. Well, that's not a new trick. It's not a new practice. In fact, the, uh, the Pharisees, as we hear in today's Gospel, they were a powerful and influential political party in Jesus' day. And they were endeavoring to do much the same sort of thing, spinning an activity that was taking place to suit their ongoing efforts to destroy Jesus' reputation and his credibility. The issue of that day was the Sabbath. While abuses of the Sabbath are common, Jesus sets the record straight and directs our attention to the Gospel. Now on this particular day, Sabbath day, an opportunity for such news was developing before the eyes of the Pharisees, and they sought to use it to spin it to discredit Jesus. And if possible, as they had hoped, indeed to punish him. Now we read in our text that Jesus and his disciples, as Mark put it, made their way through the grain. Now the disciples were hungry, and they and they plucked the heads of the grain to eat. And that in itself is permissible. That in fact actually comes from Old Testament law, Deuteronomy, for the sojourn partake of the fruits of the field as they want. However, in addition to these requirements of the law of Moses, additional rules had been created for the Sabbath, including a rule specifically against reaping. Now under the rule against reaping on the Sabbath, plucking ears, that is, you know, breaking off anything from the stalk, rubbing it between your hands to separate the grain, well, that was a kind of reaping as far as the Pharisees and really generally everyone in Jerusalem was concerned. But the punishment for reaping on the Sabbath was, was one of two things. Actually. If it was done out of ignorance, the punishment was to make an offering of sacrifice. But if it was being done purposely, well then the punishment was stoning, stoning to death. And so the Pharisees saw this opportunity to find a serious fault with Jesus. And applying their strict interpretation of the rules to the disciples' activity, the Pharisees thought that they could find fault with this rabbi for allowing his followers to disregard, indeed to break the rule. Look! Why are they not doing what is law on the Sabbath? As often happens with fake news, though, this effort by the Pharisees provided Jesus with an opportunity. He moved that conversation from fake news to the good news. And Jesus and his disciples were, as Mark puts it, making their way. Mark particularly includes this story, uses these specific words to describe what Jesus and his disciples were doing but also to call attention to the overall purpose of Jesus' time on earth as he made his way on this day and indeed on every day of his life, making his way to that sacrificial death on the cross. But in particular, the disciples were also making a way. They were leading in front of Jesus, foreshadowing that same final entry in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Now Jesus overwhelms the fake news with his word of truth. First there was the truth about the Sabbath. It exists for man. 
not man for the Sabbath. It was a day that set aside each week for physical rest and for spiritual care. But then there is the truth associated also with David. That even as David assumed authority over the law to feed his soldiers, now the greater David, the son of man, he has arrived not only to assume authority over the law, but to atone for its consequences for human time. Now these gospel truths trump any sort of legal charge that the Pharisees might have attempted to bring forward against Jesus, to destroy his reputation, his credibility. But as we consider the, the text today, it's important for us to recognize that the fake news about the Sabbath didn't end when Jesus set the Pharisees straight. There are still some accusers similar to the Pharisees, who being very proud in and of themselves for having not missed a Sunday worship for umpteen years, well, they regard observing the Sabbath as a, as a kind of litmus test judge the faith and the life of other Christians. They may even be heard say such things. Sadly, though, more common than even this are those who spin the Sabbath to suit themselves, saying, I don't really need to go to church to hear the same thing over and over and over. Do you know, I can find physical relaxation and worship of God on, on the golf course, on a soccer field, or in the great outdoors, just as well as if I were to be in, stuck in one of those pews on Sunday morning. In fact, probably even better, right? Now, such attitudes on either side, they're really a betrayal of that third commandment. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. In either case, it's a careless disregard of God's command to put him first. That our Sabbath day errors are in fact actually costing us the opportunity to receive the encouragement, the fellowship of other Christians. To receive the power of God's life-giving spirit in the gospel. The strength of faith strength of life. And so for this reason, in fact, prompted by our text this morning, it's important for us to review once more what the Old Testament Sabbath still means for us today. First, the truth is that the Sabbath was created for man. It was provided by God to satisfy an important need for all of us, a day of physical rest and spiritual restoration. Second, the truth is that when we do keep the Sabbath by assembling ourselves together for mutual encouragement, we have the opportunity to hear no less than God's spirit-laden word. And it's reminded of the work of Jesus as he made his way to the cross. And all important work as we see the day drawing near. There is, brothers and sisters, no more important work for us than to hear sins are forgiven. Go in peace. Indeed, how sad, in fact, not to mention serious, but how sad it is when we fail to make use of opportunities, to come together, to celebrate together what God has done for us, to receive the assurance of the forgiveness of our sins, to receive that word concerning Christ. There was a wealthy church man who was once approached by a, by a church college fundraiser to ask for a sizable contribution for the endowment fund of the school. The churchman's response was, no thanks, I don't like strawberries. But confused and a bit surprised, the fundraiser asked what strawberries had to do with his contribution. Churchmen explain, well, when you don't want to do something, any, any old excuse will do. And such is actually the nature of all our excuses for not remembering the Sabbath. 
thank God that the Son of Man, who on the day of our text made his way through the wheat field, making his way to save us from false pride or from lame excuses regarding the Sabbath, along with all of our other sins. And on the cross, by his blood, he says, Your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.